morning, Sun Coast.
There's nothing on the providence I know No longer bound to things of wood and stone When all I had to offer was my worst You saw my heavy heart
so beautiful to be here with you guys singing out these words together. Like science and, and and religion don't have to be at odds. No. They actually, uh, Rob Bell does this amazing like showing of like God can be so much bigger when you embrace this because That's it's right. like there is a lot of mystery in science That's and right. you know we're just trying to figure this out. But like God is alive in these in these in, in, in a lot of these things. That's it. Uh, so it just makes God that much bigger. That's right. And so they do a really good job of blending the two. Yeah. But again, like. Peter N's uh, Sin of Certainty is a fantastic book. I highly recommend that. Absolutely. Easy read, too, man. Yeah. Easy to read. He, he makes it palatable for everyone. That's it's right. not just scholarly and this, work. And this guy's PhD from Harvard University. Yeah. Man, he's, no. he's a ball. Good morning, Sun Coast. Good to see you guys. Man, I feel the energy in here, man. That's amazing. So buckle up. I'm Dr. Troy Doucet, teaching pastor here. We're excited you're with us, whether in person or watching online. Just a few quick announcements. I want to mention, if, uh, if you are new to Suncoast or maybe you've been coming a while and you have some questions about our community, immediately following this service, Miss Susan 
who is our amazing pastor of administration. She keeps this whole place running. She does a tour and takes you all around the property, all around 81 acres, shows you behind the scenes of our production, shows you behind the scenes in children's ministry, youth ministry, everything you could ever want to know about Suncoast. She hosts this amazing tour following this service. So just go in to the Grand Central Station right there, meet her, she'll take you around, and you get a free breakfast from our cafe for doing that. And also right after the second service, for those of you who may leave and come back to campus, Pastor Brett always leads an amazing in-depth class that is surrounded by individuals asking questions about the sermon topic of the day. And that happens after second service. So there's a lot of things to plug into on Sundays around here. So if you wanna join the tour, see Miss Susan. And if you want to listen to Pastor Brett's class and go deeper into the sermon content, that's after the second service, right behind these doors in what we call the VHQ. We're in week three of this series that we're calling Fear Less, Reimagining Religion. And this has been a very, very powerful series for me in my study, in my reading, in my reintegration into some of these theological ideas. And this teaching is a radical idea of rethinking, reimagining, and reengaging with these elements of our Christian faith that have often been weaponized as agents of fear mongering when it should be agents of faith building. In week one, all of these are online. You can go to our YouTube channel or to our Facebook page or our, our website, suncoastcommunity.com, and our sermons are all there. We don't hide anything. Week one was how we should fear less religion. And we talked about how toxic religion, what toxic religion wants to do is create not a sense of community, but a sense of conformity. What conformity is is what we call in, in psychology or even philosophy, it's, it's homogenistic. It means everybody looks the same, believes the same, acts the same, prays the same, and that is conformity. Community is most beautiful in diversity. That means we could have differences of opinions about these theological ideas and you not run to the next best thing and say, hey, I may not agree with that fully, but let me take Troy out for a beer or a coffee and have some conversation, right? Let me take him out to lunch. Let me take Pastor Larry to lunch and ask about these things as opposed to simply getting mad at us about something you may not agree with. Because again, we are doing in-depth study, scholarly research on these things. And religion that is toxic says this, either believe this way or you cannot be a part of this faith family and community. We don't need to fear that. Last week, I gave this teaching about we should fear less of God, that God should not come to my mind's eye resembling anything regarding fear or terror, but I should see God as my loving father and my mother. Remember, I need my dad in my life. I love my dad. I love my pops. And he brought this very masculine, disciplined, authoritarian idea to me. That was my dad. But there were many times I needed that tender touch and love from my mom. And God fits both of those identities when I need it. God corrects me when I'm wrong and even loves me through me being wrong at times. And I said this, when I see God not in fear, something happens to my heart. When I see him as this fear, fearful tyrant, I run and I hide. But when I see God as love, I stand in awe of his presence. I made mention even last week that the Bible says we cannot see God. None of us can see God. But here's the beauty of what God allows us to see. We get to see God in things in things. I see God in the beautiful. In the birth of my three children, I saw God in that process. I see God in the sunsets that I witnessed at Siesta Beach or Lido Key. I see God in the beautiful, but you also know where I see God? Not only in the beautiful, I see God in the struggle. The other day I was driving my Jeep, I was leaving home to go to the gym, and I saw this woman who she was probably in her late 60s, early 70s, and she was walking with her daughter who had a type, I knew immediately, she had a type of cerebral palsy. 
And you could tell that this woman had been with her daughter for her entire life. And I guarantee you, if I'd have pulled over my Jeep and said, hey, how has it been raising this daughter who, who was probably in her 40s or 50s? Her entire life being her one and only caregiver. Do you think her mom would have looked at me and said, oh, it was easy. It was so easy dealing with this, this, this dif difference of physicality, of biology, of physiology. No, her mom would have said, oh, it's been a struggle. And when I saw the mom and daughter walking, they were walking hand in hand. And you know what, Brett? I saw God in that, in that struggle. I worked out with some of my buddies on Toledo Beach on Thursday morning, and they kicked my butt. It was a struggle. And I think they're here to laugh at me about it, man, see if I'm walking straight today. But I saw God in that struggle of trying to keep up. I mean, I'm the old guy. I'm almost 50 years old. These guys are like early 30s, early 40s. But in that struggle, I could sense the presence of God like, you can be more. You can be better. But this week, well, next week, I'll, I'll, I'll set it up. Next week, we get to talk about hell, like how we should fear less of hell. So that'll be a good one. Bring friends who you think are going there. You know, that's sort of the... Uh, Who you think? Of, yeah, we'll, we'll we'll edit that out later, because <laughs> because your friend may may recognize your voice going woo. Is that why you brought me here, Jody? Is that why you brought me this week? But this week I have the monumental task of teaching us that we should fear less when it comes to the Bible. It's a touchy topic. I get it. Because the Bible is such a paradoxical book when you stop and really think about it. On one hand, it has been the source of power, strength, courage, inspiration, life change. Many of the moral codes of advanced civilizations are based upon that book. It has been the source of beauty. But it has also been the source of many problems and harm and pain in people's lives. And here's the problem. The issues we face when we come to this book called the Bible, because the Bible is not a book. It is a book of books, of variances, written over about 1,400 years, about 40 different authors. And it would be really, really illogical of us to think that that book from beginning to end has a inerrant, perfect consistency. Because when we approach the Bible, it is natural for us as humans to see what we want to see. This is what we call bias selection. I see what I want to see based upon my life, my experience. But then we're also taught to see what we've been trained or taught to see, and that's bias tradition, depending on maybe your geographical location where you were born or what ethnicity or race you were born into. And for all its inspiration and for all the lives it's changed, the Bible at its base is undeniably problematic and paradoxical. When it is put into the hands of egocentric, unloving, power-hungry people who never learn how to read spiritually inspired literature, it always ends in disaster because they use the book for their own means. Let me give you some examples. The Burning of Heretics. I went to school in Oxford University, at Oxford University in England, and there is a mark in a parking lot where three, they call them the Oxford Trinity, right? Three heretics from Oxford were burned publicly at a stake in the middle of the public center, which is now a parking lot across from Blackwell's books. The burning of heretics, the justification of slavery and apartheid, homophobia, denial of interracial marriages, and genocide and oppression of native peoples were all justified by cherry-picking biblical scriptures, in quotes. Seeing what we want to see or seeing what we've been taught to see. That's our problem. It reminds me of my old boys, Boudreaux and Thibodeau, right? <laughs> old Boudreaux and Thibodeau. Boudreaux became a psychiatrist. Went to med school, got his MD, and he ran into his buddy Thibodeau at the store. And Thibodeau's going, Boudreaux, I heard you became a doctor. He goes, yeah, I'm a psychiatrist. I do counseling, things like that. He goes, man, I'm struggling. He goes, well, Thibodeau, what you struggling with? He goes, I'm struggling with eating. He said, well, you're from Louisiana. We all have that problem. 
He said, come to my office, we'll see what, what's the problem. So Thibodeau went to Boudreaux's medical office, he sat in that chair, and Boudreaux said, well, Thibodeau, I'm going to show you a couple of pieces of paper, and they're going to have like ink blots on them. You guys ever saw that? It's called a Rorschach test. And he said, I'm going to show you some pictures of these ink blots, and I want you to tell me what comes to mind when you see these images, these blots of ink. So he picks up the first one, and he shows him. He goes, what you see, Thibodeau? Thibodeau goes, man, that looks like boiled crawfish. <laughs> he puts that down. He goes, man, what does this look like? Another ink blot. He goes, man, that looks like rice and gravy. <laughs> he goes, now what about this one? He goes, oh, that looks like crawfish etouffee. So Boudreaux goes, man, Thibodeau, I, I, I think you have a problem with food. And Thibodeau goes, man, you the one showing me them pictures? <laughs> You'll get that one later at Walmart, I think, right? We see what we want to see, but here's what I want to propose today. The thing is, we can't really change the book we see, the Bible. So we have to change the way we see the book. And I believe with all of my heart, soul, mind, and strength that we are transformed when we begin to see that book the same way Jesus saw that book by seeing the good in all things. Jesus had a way of interpreting scripture. He used this parable, and, and, and like really good fundamentalist, closed-minded Christians, they've used this parable to say, see, it is some people are in and some people are out. But Jesus is using this, in my opinion, to show us how we should approach the scriptures. He says, when you take grains of wheat, you have to separate the good grain of wheat from the chaff all the time. All the time. And for me, there are certain things in Scripture where Jesus is saying, look, we can't like throw this or destroy it, but we have to redeem it towards love in a particular way. Think about it. Jesus heals a man on the Sabbath, which was against the Scriptures. And what does Jesus say? Hey, the Sabbath was made for you. You were not made for it. That is a powerful, powerful teaching Jesus is trying to show us. And he always begins by saying, you have heard it said, where? In the scriptures. But now I say to you. So what is the Bible? Is it just a book? Is it the word of God? Is it a divinely inspired text? Well, what kind of book is it? Is it a book of like accurate history does it attempt to make scientific claims about the world and the universe? Is it poetry? Can I trust this book called the Bible? How accurate is its information? Does it have contradictions? Do the authors make mistakes about their claims or their stories? And if I can trust it, what should I trust this book with? With my life? With my beliefs? with my family's moral compass and upbringing, with my political associations? These are the questions we're gonna try to tackle today. What is this book, the Bible? And should, should I fear its contents? Let's look at what Jesus said about this supposed phrase that we hear thrown around so much, the word of God. Here's what Jesus says in John 17. He says, Father, I am coming to you asking that your what? Word that I have taught them, teachings that are contrary to the ways of the world, would help them to experience the same joy that I have experienced. I have given them your what? Word. And now the world hates them. Because of your word, they no longer fit in with its way of thinking and being, just as I don't fit in. Jesus says this, I'm not asking you to separate them from the world, but to keep them safe from the evil that opposes your truth. Like me, they are no longer participants in a corrupt system. Continue to equip them with the what? Truth. God, your word is truth. Not the Bible. Not the Old Testament, not the New Testament. God, your word is truth. Truth. You want to know what the word of God is? Anything that is true. And some truth comes from the Bible. Some truth came from my grandpa who had an eighth grade education. 
Some truth I learned came from my children who I thought didn't know anything. Some truth in my life came from people who didn't even believe in God. All truth is God's truth. Now, typically in traditional Orthodox theology, there have been two primary views on what, the nature of Scripture, the nature of the Bible. Inerrancy and infallibility. So I'm going to give you these words very quickly. Inerrancy is this strong belief that the entire Bible is literally the Word of God, perfect from leather to leather, Genesis to Revelation, and that it has zero errors, no mistakes, no contradictions, no incorrect assessments about the universe in all of its claims about humanity, God, historical events, the cosmos. And this is held by more fundamentalist Christians who read the Bible literally. Now there's a softer view called infallibility. It doesn't hold as strong a view as inerrancy. Infallibility believes that the Bible is true insofar as it makes claims about a person's faith or their practice of that faith. Now, I personally hold to neither one of these premises regarding the nature of, of the Bible. Now, make no mistake, in my heart and my mind, I believe the Bible is the most important book of books ever written. The New York Times lies to you every week when it puts out its bestseller list. You guys ever see that? Top 10 bestsellers. John MacArthur or whatever, this or that. No, you know what the best-selling book is? Every day of every week, of every month, of every year, the Bible. Every time. It's a remarkable book. It's the most important text to me in all of civilization, for mankind. But let me be very, very honest and truthful with you. This book did not fall out of heaven in a pretty divine package. It was written by humans, just like you and I, who were listening to God. And sometimes their response to this listening was very mature. And they did incredible things in the name of God. But if you read the Bible, sometimes their response to listening to God was very immature. What does that tell you? This is a book written by humans. It's a book to be respected, loved, honored, but most importantly, read. Read it. Many people want to defend this book and never read it. It's not a book to be feared by institutions or denominations who have weaponized it to induce fear. It's as though the Bible has become the fourth person of the Trinity. You know, Father, Son, Holy Spirit, Bible. No, it's not equal with God. When in fact, nowhere in the Bible does the Bible refer to itself as the Word of God. Jesus, in the passage that I just, told, I just read to you, said, God, your Word is what? Truth. Anytime the Bible Old Testament or New Testament, Testament refers to this phrase, the word of God or the word of the Lord. It is never about the book itself. For example, in the Old Testament, Genesis chapter 15, look it up. If you read the Bible, you'll see this. It says this, and then the word of God came to Abram in a vision saying, don't be afraid, Abram. Guess what? It wasn't the Bible speaking to Abram. The word of God came to him before any scripture was ever written down on parchment, before the Bible was ever compiled or voted on by men to be the one that you have on your shelf right now. Therefore, neither the scriptures or the Bible in that verse can be seen as the word of God. Ooh, somebody's mad at me today. Oh, you need a New Testament example? Let's go. John's gospel, John chapter one, verse one, it says this. In the beginning was the word, and the word was with God, and the word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things were made through him, and without him nothing was made. That's John one, one through three. If you read this verse in its context, it immediately disqualifies the Bible as being the word of God. Just think about how crazy it sounds if we, re we replace the word of God with the Bible in that verse. It would say something like this. In the beginning was the Bible, and the Bible was with God, and the Bible was God. 
The Bible was in the beginning with God, and all things were made through the Bible, and without the Bible, nothing was made that was made. What? No. No. I'm sorry if you're offended, but what is God's word? Truth. And I am speaking truth to you today. The oldest Bible we have on earth, both Old and New Testament, is called the Codex Sinaiticus. It was compiled around the 4th century A.D., completely in Greek. And the first published Bible that we ever have is the Gutenberg Bible, which was published in 1455. Something tells me that those were, don't count for the beginning of time to be with God. This bring me, it brings me to some points if you're taking notes today. Here's point number one. The Bible is not God. But the Bible does reveal God's word, which is always what? Truth. God is bigger than the Bible. God doesn't change, but our very limited human understanding of God does. Ancient humans believed that when volcanoes erupted or earthquakes took place or tidal waves destroyed civilizations, they believed that it was God's wrath and anger that someone did something wrong and God sent this destruction to them. Yet we know now what? These events, these events naturally occur by shifting climates, continental and tectonic plates rubbing and colliding together and other naturalistic explanations. But here's the thing. God knew that that's why volcanoes erupted and tidal waves took place way back then. But what changed? The truth of the events or human perceptions and understandings of it? I'll give you a hint. Human understanding and perception of it. When I was a college professor, I saw firsthand as a philosophy professor, 18-year-old kids who would come into my philosophy class, and God was always part of our philosophy class. We called this the philosophy of religion. And I would begin to see these 18-year-old kids who were raised in youth group, and they were taught their entire 18 years that that book was the perfect literal word of God. And I began to ask questions about what was in it. Now, many of them didn't even know what was in it. They were taught what was in it. But when I began to question them about science and the claims the Bible makes about science, six, God created the whole universe in six days? And then he had to take a break on the seventh? And then they go to their biology class and those questions were reiterated by their biology professor. Then they go to history class and the history professor was asking the same historical questions. Then they started watching History Channel and Discovery Channel and they went home by Christmas atheist. <laughs> when your faith and belief is too white, tightly round, wound around one big claim or belief, any moment of challenge it, Challenging it will just disrupt it like a domino effect. The Bible is not God, but it reveals God's truth. The Bible's not a science book. The Bible's rarely a history book. The Bible is a beautiful narration of God allowing his children to tell their story about him. Because the truth is, y'all, these biblical writers were just as human as you or I. They had no special powers, no special internet connection to God. But here's what I get back all the time when I talk to my more conservative friends who believe like that Bible is the word of God. They say, yeah, yeah, they, they were human, but they were inspired by God to write those words. So they weren't ordinary. So the Bible's not ordinary. And I agree, the Bible is the most important, extraordinary text ever written. But it's a very hard nut to crack when you ask them to explain, what does that mean to be inspired by God, to write something down? How does that work? Because I feel inspired all the time to write stuff down. I love the way biblical scholar Pete Inns, who has a PhD in theology from Harvard University, this is what he says. Any explanation of what it means for God to inspire human beings to write things down needs to account within the Bible for the diverse, ambiguous, and often contradictions the Bible has within it. Any explanation that tries to minimize this, cover it up, or push these aside 
is not an explanation at all, it's propaganda. What Dr. Inns is saying is that any attempt to simplify or reduce the facts, that the Bible literally contains hundreds of contradictions and inconsistencies. Trying to cover it up doesn't offer an explanation. It causes confusion like the students I saw in my philosophy class. Here's the truth. Human authors sometimes got the details wrong, and that's okay. For instance, here's an example. Who got to the tomb of Jesus, Jesus' empty tomb first? That seems like an important detail to know. Like, who, who saw it first? Well, we don't know, because everybody has a different story. Matthew says, the Gospel of Matthew says, Mary Magdalene, Mary the mother of James, only got there first. Mark's gospel says it was Mary Magdalene, Mary mother of James, and a woman named Salome. Luke says, no, no, it's Mary Magdalene, Mary mother of James, and a girl named Joanna who got there first. Then you read John's gospel, and John's like, no, it was Peter and John who got to the tomb first. Who was it? They can't all be right. But you know what? I don't care. Because there's a bigger picture. It's like, let's say, I don't know. My buddy Josh, man, we get tickets to the Bills game. Bills versus Saints, baby. But Josh is like, sorry, Troy, your, your ticket's in the nosebleed section. Thanks, buddy. But I'm on the 50-yard line. Josh Allen drops back, throws a pass, three seconds left. Man, he hits a wide receiver from, from those ugly Bills, right? And they score a touchdown. Man, they beat my Saints. Me and Josh meet for a beer afterwards. I'm like, dude, congratulations, man. Boy, that, that was like a nice 40-yard pass from, from Allen to, to, to Diggs or whatever. Josh is like, 40 yards? Dude, that was like 60 yards. And I'm like, oh, it was like 40, bro. No, it was 60, bro. We're, we're arguing over the details, but what's the big truth? Touchdown was scored. Saints lost. What's the big truth? Who cares who got to the tomb first? The tomb was empty. That's the point. That's the point. Bible's not God. Man, I got a lot of work to do. I got to get going, y'all. I'm excited. Point number two. The Bible is not a book that commands us to believe in something. It's a collection of texts that calls us to trust in someone. Yes, yeah, Siri, thank you for finding that. The writer of Hebrews in the New Testament proclaims the word of God is living and powerful. It is a discerner of thoughts and intents. Certainly it can't be referring to the Bible. Because in Revelation 2.23, Jesus says, I am the one who discerns the mind and the hearts of people. It is Jesus, not the Bible, that is the ultimate word, logos, truth of who God is. And it is trying to be like Christ, which is my life's goal. Jesus says this, in him was life, and that life was the light of men. Jesus maintains throughout his ministry that there can be no life in the scriptures alone. Listen to what he says to the Jewish religious leaders. You search the scriptures. This is John 5, if you want to write it down. John 5, 39. Jesus says, you search the scriptures, the Bible, for in them you think that's where eternal life is. But it's those words in that book that testify of me. That's where you find life. The Jews searched the scriptures and made the assumption, the mistaken assumption that eternal life could be obtained by reading, by memorizing them. When in fact, the Bible doesn't call us to believe in something. It calls us to trust in someone. And that person is Christ. Last point, guys. God's word is not just believable. God's word should always be livable. John says, the word truth became flesh and dwelt among us. You know what the point of the Bible is? Not to get you to believe it, to get you to live it like Jesus. We don't need to be better informed in order to believe, we need to be radically transformed in order 
to truly live like Christ. Live like Jesus. That's the whole point. Live like Jesus. Love people when they least expect it, when they least deserve it. Don't just believe it. Live it. Trust Jesus with your life. Man, he won't let you down. And what does that mean? Simply follow him. Let me pray for you, Suncoast. God, I pray for my friends, my community. God, that we would see the Bible for what it is. It is a book of wisdom calling us to trust in you. Not simply calling us to believe, but calling us to live a radically transformed life that loves people at all cost. So God, give us that strength today in Christ's name, amen. Stand with me, Suncoast. I wanna tell you a closing story real quick that sort of puts a cap on this. I talk about my kids way too much. I understand that. But I also love them way too much. My youngest daughter, Adelaide, she's 13 now, but I remember when she was growing up, she was in school, and we knew something was wrong. We knew she didn't start reading till like third grade. She had trouble understanding her alphabets. So finally, the school district's policy was to test in third grade, and we found out she had dyslexia, dysgraphia, ADHD, all these things. My heart broke. I thought, man, she's gonna be at such a disadvantage her whole life. And I just began to pray. I could not change that diagnosis. She couldn't change it. So I had to change the way I looked at her situation. I had to ask God, help me see it differently. And you know what? I no longer see, and to this day, I no longer see it as a disability, but just a difference. It wasn't something in her life, the diagnosis of dyslexia, dysgraphia. It wasn't something that needed to be remediated. It was something that needed to be celebrated. And now all of her teachers, up until just she got her report card last week, had all A's and B's. And her teachers tell me this, she's the hardest worker in this class because she knows she has to be. As her father, I knew I could not change the diagnosis. I had to change the way I saw it. When you look at that Bible on your shelf or on your table counter, you can't change it. But you can change the way you come to it and approach it. It is not a book to be feared. It is a book of wisdom that teaches us how to truly live like Christ. So go be Christ to the world today, Suncoast. We'll see you next week. Have a good one. Yeah.